and provides guidance on end of life. I'm going to try to use the lapel mic. Can you hear me? Is it okay? So thank you very much. Uh, I should retire now, I think. <laughs> uh, anyway, I'm here, and, and thank you so much uh, to Beryl and Emily for such excellent presentations that I think really have so uh, wonderfully set the context for what I can talk about today, which is really uh, a five-year project that, that I'm completed that we were trying to address many, many of the things that they so talked about. So back in 2009, uh, a team of researchers, we were funded by the Social Science and Humanities Research Council, it's a federal funding agency, to take on the issue of trying to develop resources and tools that would help long-term care homes who wanted to formalize their palliative care project. We got some additional money for knowledge translation from another agency called the Canadian Institute of Health Research. And we worked very, very collaboratively with 40 organizational partners and 10 investigators. This is the co-investigator team. Uh, and I want to particularly acknowledge Dr. Sharon Kasselinen, who is the woman to the right. She led the uh, research team based at McMaster University, and I led the research team uh, based at Lakehead University. And uh, one of our international collaborator colleagues, uh, Dr. Deb Parker from Australia, is the audience today. As, as my uh, previous speakers have uh, so eloquently explained, uh, Long-term care is a very unique context for understanding and delivering palliative care. You have that very frail older population with progressive life-limiting disease, and it is that home where people are going to both live and die. So it was identified that um, that becomes something that is very hard to reconcile. What I've come away with from my work is a good way to explain it is that long-term care provides care for life. So you come in and you are cared for for the rest of your life. Um, it's very heavily regulated and inspected and I have developed tremendous value and appreciation for the long-term care homes that I have worked with for the efforts that they make within um, what I would consider very little room to maneuver as far as how they deliver their care and, and the funding that they have. Most of the staff who work in long-term care homes, very different than hospice units, are non-regulated health care providers, personal support workers or health care aides. Most of them have not had any formal palliative care training or very, very limited. And we have minimal physician involvement. Uh, there is rarely a physician on site and the physician may come uh, once a week to uh, work with the staff in the home. And up until very recently, and, and I, I really am pleased to see this is changing, but long-term care homes have not really been acknowledged as an important location of death in our, in our health care system and are therefore not funded. Uh, in the same sense that other settings of care that have a hospice function are funded. And they have not typically been well integrated with other palliative care services. I am very pleased to say that that is also, I've seen a huge in the last five years. So what were we trying to do? We were trying to improve the quality of life for residents dying in, in long-term care homes. You probably all know this, but about 20% of residents in Ontario die each year. And uh, we're working very hard uh, to allow them the choice to die in their home, to die at home in long-term care. We wanted to develop interprofessional palliative care programs within the home itself, um, to create partnerships between the homes and community organizations that could support them in their work, like hospice volunteers, like like specialized hospice units and programs, and to use the expertise of our research team to support them in creating innovative new resources that would be helpful to them. We wanted all this to culminate into a toolkit of resources that other long-term care homes could take. 
How's that? Um, and uh, we wanted to really focus on the role of the personal support worker because they are so key to the day-to-day -day care experience that residents and families have in long-term care. And most of the work in long-term care um, that has been done has been done with the residents. So our study design was a comparative case study design where we had four long-term care homes in Ontario, two in Thunder Bay and uh, two in southern Ontario that uh, my colleague Dr. Sharon Kasseline and worked with. We used participatory action research methodology and what that really means is rather than the researchers having a preconceived idea of how things should be done, uh, we, we went in and tried to understand the problem and the culture very, very much like uh, Emily described and Burl described. And then we really worked with them to create solutions that they thought would work for them, helping them evaluate them as we went along. So it was about solving the problems as well as identifying them. Each home really did something uh, a little bit different based on their particular situation and then we tried to take the most successful of the initiatives that we saw and put them together in the, uh, the toolkit. We drew heavily on the uh, quality improvement process that long-term care homes are familiar with and, and encouraged to use because we didn't want in the work that we were doing to be doing things that would stop at the end of the five years when we were working, but to really kind of build on the normal practices of the home and, and see how we could uh, integrate palliative care that. There's been a lot of talk about um, this whole idea of thinking about palliative care in a long-term care home context. And this figure, which we promote in our toolkit, is adapted from the Canadian Hospice Palliative Care and it really shows uh, how restorative care can be concurrent with palliative care. And if you think about the resident being admitted to long-term care and the time to the resident's death, which in Ontario now is on average about 18 months, uh, and you think that when someone is entering long-term care, Everybody, as, as uh, Beryl said, probably knows that this is the place they are going to live for the rest of their lives. So what really shifts over time uh, is the relative proportion of the goals of care that are more restorative versus palliative. But there's at no point do you ever really think about a sharp transition from non-palliative to palliative because that isn't a good fit with this population at all. And then at the very um, end of this trajectory, you're looking at that end of life care. And when we started the project, when homes told us they did palliative care, really what they meant was they did end of life care. And we've really worked really to hard to push that understanding forward and this idea that to talk about a palliative approach to care is not mutually exclusive from restorative care and it is care for life and life includes death as far as I know. Uh, so these are the definitions we use. Um, so this palliative approach to care, really you can think about it beginning on admission. It gets integrated into the way you think about care all the way along the trajectory. It's, it's not prognostically based and it was talked about earlier that you can't really know for sure with a lot of the conditions and the multiple chronic conditions that residents have how long they will live but you can probably know on a needs base when they would benefit by palliative care. So it's we really try to think about, well, when would this person benefit? And probably um, when death would not be ex unexpected, you know, that surprise question, would you be surprised if this person died in the next year? And if you're not gonna be surprised, then why not plan for it, put things in place, help people be prepared? or when someone is sick enough to die. So it's all about pushing things back earlier than the end of life. Uh, usually it's signaled by a significant change in condition, 
We, we think of the palliative approach consistent with best practices in all settings of care as interdisciplinary, client-centered and holistic. Really that focus in the earlier phase is on preparation and care planning, knowing the person's wishes, knowing the person well, knowing, uh, talking with the family, making sure that family members know that we can care for your family member for the rest of his or her life and when the time comes, that is something that is an option for you. Um, and really doing that earlier so that nothing is uh, a big surprise at the end. And then the end of life phase uh, is really that uh, shorter trajectory when death is inevitable. Um, hopefully you've got uh, people's wishes um, well known and then you can support the residents and families choices really help them deal with their grief and it really extends into the bereavement phase and um, I can't go backwards in my slides but if I could I would remind you that at the end of that trajectory there was that bereavement phase in the and it really was a phase that we found to be very neglected uh, in terms of the burden of grief carried by, by residents' uh, family. So a comprehensive palliative care program from, from my perspective, from our experience, uh, is really, um, it, it spans the whole trajectory of the person's life in long-term care and really starts at admission with this bubble here where you say, uh, when the person's admitted, we will care for you for the rest of your life. That's all you have to say. That's probably all families want to hear. But we were very surprised at how many families who towards the end of life didn't even know it was an option for them to stay in long-term care. And what families have told us is not on admission, because admission is very overwhelming, but shortly thereafter, within three or four weeks, they would appreciate somebody calling them and coming and saying, come on in and let's sit down and uh, speak with the resident uh, about their wishes, speak with the family about their expectations, what do we need to know to look after your family member for the rest of his or her life really well? You know, so you don't have to be talking about dying, but you can be talking about care. Um, and then the next big thing, if you can get through that, the next big thing is when, when the care goals that are palliative dominate over the restorative. In other words, the health condition has declined considerably. It's a good time to reconnect with the family. Uh, it's a good time to have a palliative care case conference. Uh, and Deb Parker's going to speak about her work on that in Australia later on. Um, and really get people together to create a really good care plan. Uh, there shouldn't be any surprises. Um, and then you are uh, moving forward and eventually you uh, reach the end of life phase, you know, where the people are imminently dying. And if you've done good work before, um, you know, what you're really doing then is supporting residents and families and, and really helping them manage their, their grief. Uh, it's a very emotional time. And then the, end, the actual time around the death and then that bereavement uh, phase that that is so important where staff uh, really have been carrying a tremendous burden of grief uh, that has not been well appreciated, I think, as have other residents uh, because homes have been reluctant to talk about, uh, about um, and I think, you know, when I die, I want at least somebody to mention it. I mean, if you don't mention it, it's like it didn't matter that I was there at all. <laughs> what kind of a message is that? Um, so that's the structure of our framework, and I'm just going to quickly run through it. Um, we have a philosophy of palliative care that is very compatible, I think, with resident-centered care and... Hmm? Okay, resident-centered care. We have a, a program description that has been designed to uh, meet the Ontario long-term care home standards. And very importantly, we have a process of change because I believe 
that what is needed is a culture change in long-term care where people can both come to long-term care to both live and die and we're comfortable talking about that and it's not a quick fix. I think it's about a three-year process which I'm quickly going to get into and then a whole bunch of modules in services and resolve you with that. So how do you do this pro change? I believe that it has four very important roles. You need a senior manager to sponsor the change, to make an organizational commitment, a facilitator, uh, a clinical facilitator within your home. It could be a care coordinator, a, a nurse, a social worker, um, to facilitate a palliative care resource team. You need a personal support worker lead to really uh, get the personal support workers on board and you need to develop an inal team. This is why the PSWs are key because the train isn't going to get out of the station if the PSWs aren't. Um, what can they do? They can promote the program, the palliative care program with their peers. They really helped us understand how to make resources and tools that would make their lives easier uh, because they really want to do a good job for families. They, they really care about the residents. Um, and so this is how you can find a PSW lead and some of the characteristics that uh, your PSW channel needs. Secondly, uh, we believe you need to create an interprofessional palliative care resource team. This is not a clinical team. Everybody in the home does palliative care. But this is a resource team, a change champion team, with everybody on it can um, provide leadership uh, move the program forward with policy and then we took them out on a retreat to really look at what were the goals, the missions, the value forward and then they started having these regular monthly meetings to build their palliative program from the ground up. They, as I said, weren't a clinical team. They did a lot of mentoring of staff providing emotional support, information sharing, identifying educational needs, and really helping the managers guidelines. They really spent a lot of time talking about language and um, what their mission was. We've created an audit tool which Holmes have found very helpful. It's a self-assessment in which we've laid out what we think are the organizational structures, the care processes, and the outcome evaluators that homes can um, look at to see whether they have these things in place and what they're doing well and where their gaps are move forward. Um, the team can complete this and identify the starting point for their work. This, the self-assessment tool can also be done, say, twice a year, and then teams can measure their progress in terms of formalizing some of the good things that are going on and filling of the gaps. So these are some of the resources in our toolkit and I gave you a handout. You can go on our website. All of our tools are open access. They're free. Unfortunately, if you want print copies, you have to pay for them just because of the printing cost. But we um, have the self-assessment tool. Competencies in palliative care for personal support workers, which we developed with our personal support worker champions, because they didn't have a scope of practice clearly defined. Um, grief and loss policies and practices for the staff, how to go about doing that day that I talked about. Um, tools for personal support workers uh, to identify uh, and screen when a resident is in pain so they can communicate the need for a pain assessment with a registered nurse. Um, training for the palliative performance scale and we've talked about that in a few uh, sessions today. It's not a prognosticator but it's one of the most helpful tools we have for staff to begin to identify when a resident is transitioning to that time when uh, death would not be unexpected. We have tools for advanced care planning and all kinds of other psychosocial support. Uh, lots of education tools. Um, hospice visits was something that we found very helpful where we partnered with a community uh, 
uh, hospice and staff from the long-term care went and spent a day or two observing, just trying to understand the culture of hospice. Uh, we have lots of in-service education courses uh, for staff at all levels. And these are really important community partnerships and, and Emily will be pleased to see that the Alzheimer's Society is, is up on there. They have some wonderful resources for end of life. And the palliative pain and symptom consultants have been just instrumental and I think most long-term care homes have access to them. They came in on a regular basis and did rounds with the staff and uh, really helped them implement the tools. Communication has come up as a huge issue and we spent a lot of time on communication. Uh, I'm going to talk about the comfort care bag just for a second. Um, this was a PSW idea. They were so distressed when a family was sitting vigil at the bedside and the resident was dying and they didn't know what to say and there was very little they could do. And so we said like, well, what do you think we could do about that? So they brainstormed. And the comfort care bag is basically a gift bag um, with uh, some pamphlets in it about what to expect when someone is dying, uh, food for thought, you know, why isn't my loved one eating, it's about grief. Then there's a crossword puzzle and a toothbrush and some candy. If they know the resident is of a particular faith, there might be, you know, a, a faith symbol in it. Uh, a poem. So, so the staff communicate their, their care and concern to the families by creating these individualized comfort care bags and then one of the staff goes in and gives it to them. And in terms of engaging the personal support workers in this project, I would say that was a game changer because that made their life easier and it made them feel better about what they were doing. Um, staffs now send sympathy cards and they write visually on them. So this is our website. Uh, you can just log on to there. You'll see Alliance Toolkit on the left. Click on there. You'll, it'll, there'll be a drop-down menu of all the different types of tools. Um, there's, I think, over 60 of them up there already. And as I say, they're all downloadable for for you unless you want to print copy. And we have a display uh, so you can go and see the toolkit in print copy if you're interested. This is just how what the kits include. Okay, thank you very much. Great, thank you.